Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, EBSD OIM Analysis with NPAR, or How to Salvage Your Datasets. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are several applications widgets you can use. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. I will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed, or we run out of time, you will receive an answer later via email. A copy of today's slide deck and some links to additional materials are available in the resource list widget. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximum icon in the top right or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the help widget and has a question mark and covers common technical issues. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Now I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Patrick Camus. I received my BS and PhD degrees from the University of Pittsburgh in Material Science. I spent 18 years in atom probe analysis at Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, National Institute of Standards Technology, and the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I then worked for 15 years in electron beam microanalysis with uh, EDS, EBSD, and WDS at Thermo Fisher Scientific. I moved to EDAX in early 2013 as a principal product development engineer, became director of research and innovation in 2014. And now on to the webinar. The motivation for the webinar is that the emphasis of modern EBSD systems is often on speed. Uh, for instance, the specification of our Hikari Super is greater than 1400 index patterns per second. But these short exposures may lead to poor pattern quality uh, in the diffraction patterns that are acquired. Other factors that can lead to poor pattern quality are low voltage, low beam current, and low sample perfection. Sometimes you have controls over these, sometimes you don't, sometimes the samples restrict you from optimizing the parameters. Usually to increase the pattern quality, you will want to go to higher voltages or higher beam current or perform frame averaging. But those are not always amenable, so that means that you will have poor pattern quality, usually by increased noise in the diffraction patterns. But do we have to accept this poor pattern quality and the resultant poor map quality? I will show a few examples of what I mean by increased noise or decreased pattern quality here before we go into some examples. So in this slide shows some diffraction patterns taken on the same sample, although obviously uh, different crystals on the sample because the patterns change, with using different gain values of the camera. So we start with a gain of zero and go up to a gain of 25. If we keep the same um, total intensity on the camera, we therefore can decrease the exposure time. If we decrease the exposure time, we can increase the frames per second, and that's the numbers at the bottom. So we go from approximately 45 frames per second to 783 frames per second, but as you can see, the quality of the diffraction pattern decreases because there's increased noise in the diffraction pattern. These are quite useful, even at the uh, gain of 25, but you see that it does decrease, and with that decrease, puts a slight uncertainty in the uh, indexing routines by trying to find the band uh, detection, first of all, and then the indexing routine. So this is where the noise looks like, what noise appears to be in the diffraction patterns as you get decreased noise, increased noise and decreased uh, quality. If you have the very lowest of quality in your diffraction patterns, your eye won't pick up very much of any diffraction pattern uh, in the uh, acquired camera patterns, and that'll lead to maps of quality like this. Although your eye can see the outlines of some of the colored grains, really for any kind of quantitative analysis, you really can't measure any features off of these maps, so you really don't want to have these quality of maps to be analyzed to, uh, for any kind of interpretation. So you really would like to increase the quality of the maps. Um, 
You can do metrics on measuring the quality of the diffraction pattern and the quality of the indexing, and this is one uh, set of curves that are obtained for four different materials. Some materials, the increase in noise doesn't degrade the indexing too much. That would be the top line up the top, the purple with the X's. Other materials have different grades on it. Normal working ranges and a typical maximum are listed on the noise. Sometimes you have a little more flexibility as an analyst, but as you notice, as you increase the noise to extreme values, the indexing goes down, therefore the quality of the patterns go down, the quality of the maps go down. So we really want to work in an operational mode where the indexing quality is well above 90%, hopefully above 95%. Some people would argue you need at least 97%, but those are philosophical questions. Today we're talking about numbers well below 90%, and what can we do if that's all that it, the sample will provide you, all the, the analysis will provide you. There are some traditional routines built into EBSD software to increase the map quality. Um, obviously, if there is zero diffraction pattern, you will have holes in your data sets. This particular data set doesn't have any holes, but there are data sets later in this webinar that will have holes in the data sets. It's not much you can do. Uh, you really don't want to do a simple averaging of the orientations because the orientations are vectors, and averages of vectors give other vectors, and so it really leads to complicating values. What the usual method is, is a cleanup method, is a replacement, so it looks at the nearest neighbors, finds the dominant uh, orientation from those nearest neighbors and substitutes in. So it's a type of a dilation, if you want to think of it like that. So it's a very simple analysis. It really isn't increasing the quality of the data. It's just filling in and replacing pixels in the uh, map. At the time, it was the best uh, algorithm available, but it can lead to uh, slightly noisy patterns and uh, some artifacts can develop using this routine. The routine I'm going to be talking about today, we uh, call it NPAR, it's Neighbor Pattern Averaging, followed by re-indexing. Uh, what we will do is record all the EBSD patterns during the acquisition. NPAR can be done during the acquisition. Usually it's not, but it can. Usually it's done by reprocessing the uh, data sets offline. The logic is that you average the six neighboring patterns with the central pattern, so now you get an average of all seven patterns around that central pattern. When you average those patterns, the noise gets averaged out. The signal to noise therefore increases so that the pattern quality gets better through this averaging method. It's very similar to frame averaging, but it's a little that it can be done during acquisition, but it's a little bit different than that. It's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, but it's similar. But the advantage is you only have to do a single exposure and don't have to do multiple exposures, which you would do with frame averaging. So you get this new diffraction pattern that is illustrated in the center of the image, which is the average, and now you do your traditional indexing methods using any of the variables any of the parameters that you need to index it, you re-index that diffraction pattern, get new indexing, and then you get new maps from that. So now what we're doing is getting higher quality data out of the data that you've already collected, the diffraction patterns that you've already collected. So to show you this as a model by, we will put artificial noise on here, what we did is collected a very high quality map at very slow acquisition rates to get very high quality, not the absolute best quality diffraction patterns, but very high quality diffraction patterns with a very high indexing success rate on here. And you can see the map is a very beautiful map. The patterns are a little bit low quality, but it's very high quality to give us a high map. So we start with these. And now what we do is artificially add noise to the diffraction patterns and now re-index them and see what the noise, how the noise affects the indexing routine and the quality of the map, and then see how the NPAR routine does in bringing back the quality in the both the diffraction patterns and the maps. 
So if we look on this, we start with the zero noise, and it's a 99.8% indexing rate. There are some pixels that are unindexable. As we add the noise, you can see in the top row maps, starting from right and going left, we start to get more speckles in the maps. Those speckles are bad index regions. The bad index regions are obviously because of the lower quality in the diffraction patterns. And that is associated with the lower curve in the right-hand figure. As the noise level goes up, the indexing success rate goes down, and we get uh, more speckles in the maps. The map quality is not as good as we'd like. Now, if we apply the NPAR on the diffraction patterns themselves, so these will be the noisy diffraction patterns, the averaging takes out some of the noise, not all of it, but some of the noise. We now re-index, and we see what the indexing success rate is. And once again, as we go from the bottom, we can see that the indexing rate is at very, very high uh, percentage rates even with the very noisiest of patterns, the 1.0 noise, which originally was only 24% indexing, goes up to 98% indexing. And that's just by taking the nearest neighbor averages of the diffraction patterns, the data that we already have, average the data together, get a new diffraction pattern, re-index it, and the pattern quality goes up. Now this is an extreme case, and it works extremely well at this 24%. Usually it doesn't work quite that well. We'll see uh, later from more examples how well it will do based on the different materials. But in this particular experiment, it took extremely bad math that you would never like to publish. You wouldn't like to perform quantitative analysis on it and recovers almost all of the uh, information, the orientation information that we did by looking at pristine diffraction patterns. To do a little bit more real-world experiment, in this particular experiment, to show the differential, we are increasing the gain, as I showed you in an earlier slide. So now we will increase the gain and therefore decrease the exposure to use the same well depth, the same number of electrons on the um, chip of the camera. So as we increase the gain it will and decrease the exposure, the noise will necessarily increase. And as we see in the last column in the table, the indexing success rate decreases markedly from a very excellent 99% down to a 0.1%, which essentially is nothing. So we will see how NPAR can affect those values. So now we have these noisy values. And as scanned is the top row of maps. And you can see as the noise level increases, the quality of the map decreases as we've seen previously. So you would really like to work, use only the first column. That second column data, it's really getting quite poor. You really wouldn't want to publish that one if you could help it. If we look at the bottom row to see what the NPAR gives us, obviously it's not going to do anything for the first column. The second column that we really wouldn't want to publish the as scanned, now that quality is significantly higher. We could easily publish that. The third column, we could even publish that. That's 94%. That's on the edge of uh, the threshold that maybe you'd like, but that is a significantly enhanced map there. The last column, obviously, NPAR can't recover that. That is just too noisy. You can't do anything with it. Even NPAR can't recover any real value out of that. It tried its best, but it can't do that. So what we've seen is with data sets that you appear to be unsalvageable, that you would throw it away, you can't interpret it, like the third column, the 30 gain data set, NPAR takes the diffraction patterns, reduces the noise, re-index them, and that is salvageable data that you can now interpret and you can analyze and you would be able to publish that data. Now let's go on to some more real world examples. In this particular case, uh, at 100 patterns per second, at 100 picoamps of beam current, uh, pretty conservative by all uh, metrics. Uh, traditional indexing really didn't do a very good job. Your eye picks out the grains, but there's a lot of noise left in there. By applying the NPAR routine, we get up to 98% indexing. Uh, through the grains, you can see the central portions of the grains are very, very clean. A lot of the 
uh, bad pixels, the black pixels are along boundaries, as could be expected, and there are some holes in the sample, probably due to pits or holes in the sample, and you can't recover from those holes. But by and large, we have some really nice data here. <clears throat> Another slight variation by changing the beam parameters on the microscope, we now go to 500 patterns per second, which is moving along pretty nicely at only 500 picoamps of beam current, which is still pretty low. Traditional methods, there's not really much there. Your eye picks up some colored regions for the grains, but really not too good, only 22% indexing. However, by applying the NPAR on the diffraction patterns that you collect, you get 96% indexing. So very, very high quality indexing. You obviously have some noise within the grain even after we're done, but now you can actually have some data that you can quantitatively measure to really uh, have some proper interpretation of the data sets. Since we are affecting the quality of the diffraction pattern itself, any derivative maps or images that are based on the diffraction pattern itself actually will increase the quality of the, of the map. So in this case, we're looking at uh, indexing quality maps, and on the left is the unprocessed, on the right-hand side is the NPAR processed, and it tends to reduce the uh, noise in the, these maps and tends to increase the contrast a little bit. You can see the right-hand image is a much prettier image to deal with, and this was collected at about 880 patterns per second and a pretty high gain. If we look at the inverse pole figure color maps for this, the original maps appear to be pretty high quality, although the indexing success rate was only 74%, 75% with that. You can see that there, focus on one particular region, you can see that there are some speckles in the image based on the noise, but if we do the NPAR, most all of those speckles are gone and we're up approaching 97%. This is once again with the original data and just simple re-indexing routines, re-indexing the data set afterwards. Magnesium samples, which are notorious for giving very low quality uh, patterns and maps, even at the best polishing conditions, you usually don't get really great uh, patterns like you do with the steel samples or nickel transition metal samples. Uh, and in this case, the left-hand pattern, the raw data, is only a 63% indexing rate. The NPAR increases that up to 74%. So it's increased it by 10% uh, increased quality. Still does not get you up to approaching 100%, but it makes it better. Maybe this will help you a little bit more of interpretation by getting this quality. NPAR isn't the be-all, end-all, but it does help in getting better maps, better data for interpretation. Another magnesium sample, this sample created uh, much better maps with the raw data at the top of the screen, success rate about 73%. You can see there's a lot of noise in the maps. By applying the NPAR afterwards in both the uh, IQ maps and the inverse pull figure maps, we are now up to a success rate of 96%, so very high quality maps, very few noise pixels in the centers of the grains. Most of the noise pixels seem to be at boundaries, and those we can uh, deal with for interpretation purposes. Really nice quality data. Here we have aluminum. Sometimes aluminum is a little bit of a challenge. It is a low density material. Sometimes it gives a little bit lower uh, quality diffraction patterns. This particular one is cold rolled, so it will also have deformation in it. The deformation in the sample will also lead to lower quality diffraction patterns. Uh, so you can see that we're only at 72% indexing for the acquired data set. And on that right-hand side, that right-hand quarter of the image, it's probably even lower than that. It may be approaching 50%. Maybe that's poorly prepared region of the sample, maybe it's higher deformation, don't know exactly, but there is a, a change in variation, some high quality regions and some low quality regions. If we apply the NPAR routine to this, now we're approaching 95% indexing, that's very high indexing, uh, very few 
bad pixels in the centers of the grains, mostly once again at the grain boundaries. We do have some holes in the data sets due to, vacant, uh, due to voids, inclusions, whatever it is, but we have now have a very nice data set that we can really interpret. You can see the grains, the subgrains uh, in the structure, and you can really interpret what the structure is. Uh, IQ maps, this is a very coarse size, so these are larger uh, steps. These are uh, approximately one micron steps. We have the image quality map on the left and the right-hand side. You can see it reduces the noise, increases the contrast. You can see some substructure and possibly some recrystallized grains in the uh, IQ maps, IQ images. If we look at the inverse pull figure for the same data set, it uh, has a little bit of an increase by reducing the noise doesn't seem to be as drastic as some of the other ones, but it does increase that. And those are fairly large step sizes. It also works on very small step size materials. Here is 70 nanometer steps using a tungsten SEM. It's a, the original data appears to be a little bit foggy, not really crisp, not well defined, but by applying the NPAR we get really crisp looking images, smooths out some of the noise in the centers of the grains and the subgrains, really looks to be quite, quite nice uh, image quality map. And if we look at the inverse pull figure data sets, really cleans up the data set significantly and uh, you can really see the subgrains and the grains themselves in the uh, data sets right here. This is a particularly interesting data set. This is a brachiopod, so it's mostly calcium carbonate. Very beam sensitive material. You can't put very much beam current in either energy or uh, count rate into it. You have to be very, very careful that you'll damage your sample. Um, so you can see there's very low contrast in the indexing quality on the left-hand side. The um, NPAR really brings some of that out. You can start to see some of these very, very small grains. The really small grains really uh, are apparent once you look at inverse pole figure. There's not really much information on the left-hand side because the pattern quality is just so low because the sample is giving you low quality current, low quality diffraction patterns. But with the NPAR and the averaging of the nearest neighbors, you can start to pull out a lot more in the upper left-hand quadrant, which is extremely poor, and it starts to fill in much more in the lower right-hand quadrant, which had medium quality in the original data set, now brings that out a lot better uh, to get some very high quality patterns, uh, very high quality maps, so that now you can start to interpret what the information was there. In the original data set, you would think it's unsalvageable, you'd have to throw that data away, the NPAR really brings out the uh, quality in at least some of the regions, not the whole map, but at least some of the regions so that now you can interpret. Some materials have very high charging associated with them, so if you're at high um, beam voltages and high beam currents, you get lots of charging in the sample and you get very distorted maps as it's shown in the left-hand side. So they give you the best quality of the pattern, but not the best quality of the maps due to the charging of the sample. So if you change the SEM condition such that you are low, at lower beam current and lower beam voltages, then you reduce the incidence of the charging. You naturally reduce the quality of the diffraction patterns also because you're reducing the um, quality of the beam, if you will. So now you're going to get worse diffraction patterns, but by applying NPAR and it averages and smooths them out and increases the quality, you can get the quality back, a vast majority of it, in this case almost all of the quality back, and now you can get a map of the real microstructure of the sample by running at non-optimum EBSD conditions by using NPAR to reduce the noise, and you get a very, very nice uh, map. Transmission EBSD is one of the latest uh, techniques to use, so you effectively use a TEM sample uh, to look at very, very thin regions of the sample. Because you're going to thinner regions, it tends to have a little bit lower uh, pattern quality, so they sometimes can run into issues. 
with the indexing quality, the NPAR really starts to pick out and, and sharpen up these features that are available in the uh, image quality. And as you look at the inverse pole figure, there's just a tremendous amount of noise in the left-hand one. Your eye can think it sees grains, but really can't do any quantitative work. Whereas by applying the NPAR on even this very poor map, you would obviously like to get much higher quality maps than that. But on this particular map, it's a low quality. The NPAR can pull it out. And now you start to see some of these subgrains are actually valid interpretations. And so if you're looking for the subgrain boundaries and the angles between those, you can start to do some interpretation. Obviously, it can't save the whole data set. Even on the right-hand side, it just can't salvage enough of the data set to get everything out of that. You would think, well, it really should degrade the boundaries. Why wouldn't it degrade boundaries? You can obviously understand it can fix the centers, but it should degrade the boundaries. But if you look at these uh, schematics, that when you average a bunch of these patterns together, the resultant pattern will be dominated by either the right-hand grain or the left-hand grain. So even though you're mixing more grains, you think maybe it would decrease it, it actually still increases the quality of the pattern, and it'll still be dominated by whatever side that the diffraction pattern is on in the original data. The grain boundary, really, we don't expect it to, to move. And if it moves one pixel or two pixels uh, along a whole grain boundary, one or two pixels won't affect grain sizes and things along those lines too much. So we really don't have see any kind of a problem with single, well-spaced uh, boundaries. However, you can obviously see that if you would have two boundaries going through this same kernel nearest neighbors, for instance, a single pixel-wide twin, that that could create problems. And in point of fact, it actually does. If you look at the regions that are circled in the left-hand original data and the right-hand data, these single pixel-wide twins do disappear in the NPAR data sets. So if you are concerned about very, very thin features that are appro approaching one pixel width in size, then really you need to reconsider how you're acquiring the data, because you would really like to have more pixels going across those single boundaries, those single uh, pixel-wide twins than what you're doing here. So actually, you have to reevaluate the uh, acquisition parameters. Usually, it's the step size associated with it. But that is a caveat that NPAR can get, can get rid of single pixel twins or single pixel grains, if you will, by applying the kernel operation. So the conclusions that we've seen going through here, so NPAR enables successful EBSD mapping using low quality diffraction patterns. It improves the data that users are already collecting. The only thing that you have to do is store the diffraction patterns. You're already collecting all of the maps and the map data and the orientation data. Just select the checkbox to save the uh, diffraction patterns, and then you can apply the analysis, the NPAR, and all the other subsequent indexing routines to apply the NPAR processing. The pattern averaging procedure increases contrast and IQ maps and other maps and improves the orientation precision with only minimal loss of detail. NPAR is more time effective than significantly increasing the exposure or frame averaging. For instance, it's approximately the same quality as uh, seven frame averages, but obviously you'd have to collect for seven times longer to do that. So you can get the increased speed and then do the processing afterwards. The processing typically takes a minute, maybe less than a minute, depends how fast your computer is, something about that time. So uh, it's a very small portion of time compared to doing seven times frame averaging. Pixel spacing for maps should be considered, as we just have seen. Uh, features on the size of the kernel size uh, will be averaged out and could disappear. And um, ideal. It's the application of NPAR is ideal in situations where speed or low beam current conditions are critical or you're restricted to that, like the brachiopod, that you just can't do put in any more um, energy into the sample, that you're restricted. So in any of these conditions that are high resolution tungsten SEM conditions, which is low beam current, small spot size, in situ measurements where you don't have much time, you have to move along, 
uh, and collect the data, 3D where you're having so many sections that you want to minimize the time, or beam sensitive as I alluded to. So these are all the situations where the NPAR can start with low quality data. You don't want the lowest quality, but can start with as low a quality as you can tolerate and apply the NPAR and get as high a quality data out of the data sets as you possibly can. There are additional resources available from EDAX. There are some links that are shown on the screen. The main thing I want to point out at this time, however, is for more specific information on NPAR, we are uh, planning on having an NPAR software tutorial as a webinar in July. So uh, Sean will be going through actually showing you in the OIM software how to apply the steps, what steps are needed to apply the NPAR uh, routine and show you the results uh, in live data sets. The other thing is if you are attending the M&M uh, conference later in the summertime, I will be having a poster up there on a scientific analysis of exactly what is happening pixel by pixel compare and contrast from the original data onto an NPAR data uh, set on the maps to see what pixels change, where it changes, what the distributions of the uh, quality is, what the distributions of the uh, orientations are. So a very scientific analysis for that. So with that, I thank you. And we'll take a look at some of these uh, uh, questions and see if we can um, uh, answer some of these questions. Um, let me see if I can pop up some of these. Uh, not really. Can you run data sets from other systems? We uh, we can run some data sets from certain. Uh, other systems, that's a limitation of the uh, OIM uh, version 8 is the latest version. Uh, some of the diffraction patterns we can read, some of the diffraction patterns we can't. So we have to look at specific details of what you have. Uh, we can apply NPAR on 3D measurements. Uh, logically, for the NPAR, we would logically apply it on a slice-by-slice uh, -slice basis. Uh, to go through, and uh, so whatever mechanism we have for applying uh, batch processing to all of the slices in a normal OIM analysis, re-indexing -anal re analysis, we can apply that with the NPAR as just an additional step in there to uh, perform that. So yes, we can apply that. Um, the uh, NPAR analysis I won't go into details of where it can be done in the software, but it's on the single pixel analysis uh, menu button. When you go into the single pixel, it's in a menu item on the right-hand side. And Sean will actually be going into more details with that in the uh, webinar in a couple of months. Uh, NPAR is only available with OIM8, so you will have to uh, upgrade your software to do that. Um, does NPAR generate any artifacts? Does it affect spatial resolution and subsequent parameters? Uh, for instance, grain size. Uh, we have not seen in any um, artifacts that it generates or a negative effect on grain size. Actually, we don't see any. Um, motion of the grain boundaries to a significant effect. As I said, maybe one pixel, maybe two pixels on a whole grain maybe will move. Uh, that, those are some of the results that I've seen in my scientific analysis. Um, to a first approximation, we don't see any other artifacts other than the single pixel wide twins disappearing. Um, it doesn't seem to affect uh, statistically, any of the grain size metrics, any of the positional metrics of the grains or the grain sizes. Um, uh, I do want to say there is one additional caveat that I didn't emphasize here is there, if you are looking for uh, trying to quantify strain or look for very, very subtle um, subgrains and subgrain boundaries, 
There could be some effect on that. You, it will have to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Obviously, if you're taking the average of seven pixels, there could be very, very subtle deviations on the order of a tenth of a degree. And if you're looking for strain on the order of a tenth of a degree, then obviously it could have a very subtle effect. So strain is the main artifact. You have to be very careful and analyze it on a case-by-case -case basis. If you're doing strain, you're usually collecting diffraction patterns relatively slowly to get high quality diffraction patterns because you're looking for very subtle orientation changes. But NPAR could do that subtle changes on the order of the strain measurement. So you have to be very, very careful and investigate that a little bit closer. Uh, yes, this is the NPAR that's in the team software. So it's it's all the same nomenclature. Um, we have a question that uh, during neighbor orientation replacement, also a point is replaced by the average of the neighbors. Uh, the question is, this is not so different than NPAR actually. In point of fact, it is tremendously different than a replacement. In there, it's a simple bitmap replacement, if you will. Usually you're replacing a color with a neighboring color, whatever neighboring colors. If there's three blues and there's one red and one green, then you're going to replace it with a blue, and you'll replace it. That's not what we're doing with NPAR. We are taking the average of the diffraction patterns, and now we're do applying a re-indexing at that new pixel replacement. So it is a smoothing of the diffraction pattern by taking the nearest neighbors. It's not a direct replacement of the maximum or the median pixel replacement. It's actually re-indexing the data set using smooth data. Uh, how long does it take to run through the NPAR? Depending upon how fast your computer is, I've seen some as short. It obviously depends on the number of pixels. I've seen a 512 by 512 take as little as um, 45 seconds on some computers and maybe a minute to a minute and a half on other computers to run. So it's still, it's not instantaneous. You will have a little bit of a delay, but it's uh, not as long a delay that you can run and go get a cup of coffee and come back. It's going to be done way before that. Uh, is the processing live or post? You can theoretically do it live. Uh, we don't suggest that. Uh, it does take some additional processing. It depends on what speed you're uh, operating at. It only takes a minute, uh, approximately, to do it post-processing, so usually we prefer to do it uh, post-processing. There is an additional benefit, very subtle uh, benefit by doing post-processing, is that you can then also have an additional options of changing any of the indexing, either the Huff uh, band detection routines or the indexing routines after the fact. We found that if you tune those a little bit more, you even get better data by retuning those. The parameters that are used for the band detection and for the indexing are usually optimized to run very fast uh, parameters on those. So there's sometimes a little bit of, uh, of uh, give and take on setting those parameters. However, when you can adjust them, after the fact and post-processing, it gives you a lot more flexibility. So usually we perform them after the fact, um, and it doesn't slow down the computer. You don't put that additional uh, processing needed for the NPAR on the computer as it's acquiring. So you just acquire everything as fast as you dare to. If that's 100 patterns per second or if that's 15, 1,400 patterns per second, you acquire it as fast as you deem necessary and then do the post-processing at your leisure. You can actually get it off the microscope and analyze it back at your desk if you have the uh, local um, uh, local software. Um, I don't see any other questions associated with that. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn that back over to uh, the organizer and see if uh, uh, that. So once again, thank you for attending. The uh, movie of this will be up online in hopefully 24 to 48 hours. So thank you very much. I appreciate you attending today.